Section 25 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Madame Bo Peep of the Ranches. Part 1. Aunt Ellen, said Octavia, cheerfully, as she threw her black kid gloves carefully at the dignified Persian cat on the window seat. I'm a pauper. You are so extreme in your statements, Octavia dear, said Aunt Ellen, mildly, looking up from her paper. If you find yourself temporarily in need of some small change for bonbons, you will find my purse in the drawer of the writing desk. Octavia Bupre removed her hat and seated herself on a footstool near her aunt's chair, clasping her hands about her knees. Her slim and flexible figure, clad in a modish morning costume, accommodated itself easily and gracefully to the trying position. Her bright and youthful face, with its pair of sparkling, life enamored eyes, tried to compose itself to the seriousness that the occasion seemed to demand. You good, Auntie, it isn't a case of bonbons. It is abject, staring, unpicturesque poverty. With ready-made clothes, gasoline gloves, and probably one o'clock dinners all waiting, with the traditional wolf at the door. I've just come from my lawyer, Auntie, and please, ma'am, I ain't got nothing at all. Flowers, lady? Buttonhole, gentlemen? Pencils, sir? Three for five to help a poor widow? Do I do it nicely, Auntie? Or as a breadwinner accomplishment? Were my lessons in elocution entirely wasted? Do be serious, my dear, said Aunt Ellen, letting her papers fall to the floor long enough to tell me what you mean. Colonel Bupre's estate? Colonel Bupre's estate, interrupted Octavia, emphasizing her words with appropriate dramatic gestures, is of Spanish castellar architecture. Colonel Bupre's resources are wind. Colonel Bupre's stocks are water. Colonel Bupre's income is all in. The statement lacks the legal technicalities to which I have been listening for an hour, but that is what it means when translated. Octavia, Aunt Ellen was now visibly possessed by consternation. I can hardly believe it. And it was the impression that he was worth a million. And the de Pasters themselves introduced him. Octavia rippled out a laugh, and then became properly grave. De mortis nil, Auntie. Not even the rest of it, the dear old Colonel. What a gold brick he was, after all. I paid for my bargain fairly. I'm all here, am I not? Items. Eyes, fingers, toes, youth, old family, unquestionable position in society, as called for in the contract. No wildcat stock here. Octavia picked up the morning paper from the floor. But I'm not going to squeal. Isn't that what they call it when you rail at fortune? Because you've lost the game? She turned the pages of the paper calmly. Stock market? No use for that. Society's doings, that's done. Here's my page, the wish column. A Van Dresser could not be said to want for anything, of course. Chambermaids, cooks, canvassers, stenographers. Dear, said Auntie, with a little tremor in her voice, please do not talk in that way, even if your affairs are in so unfortunate a condition. There's my three thousand. Octavia sprang up lightly and deposited a smart kiss on the delicate cheek of the prim little elderly maid. Blessed Annie, your three thousand is just sufficient to ensure your hyson to be free from willow leaves and keep the Persian in sterilized cream. I know I'd be welcome, but I prefer to strike bottom like Beelzebub rather than hang around like the Perry, listening to the music from the side entrance. I'm going to earn my own living. There's nothing else to do. I'm a... Oh, oh, I'd forgotten. There's one thing saved from the wreck. It's a corral. No, a ranch. Let me see. Texas. An asset, dear old Mr. Bannister called it. How pleased he was to show me something he could describe as unencumbered. I've a description of it among those stupid papers he made me bring away with me from his office. I'll try and find it. Octavia found her shopping bag and drew from it a long envelope filled with typewritten documents. A ranch in Texas, sighed Aunt Ellen. It sounds to me more like a liability than an asset. Those are places where the centipedes are found, and cowboys and fandangos. The Rancho de las Sombras, 
Red Octavia, from a sheet of violently purple typewriting, is situated 110 miles southeast of San Antonio and 38 miles from its nearest railroad station, Nopal, on the I-N-G-N Ranch. Consists of 7,680 acres of well-watered land with title conferred by state patents and 22 sections, or 14,080 acres, partly under yearly running lease and partly bought under State 20-Year Purchase Act, 8,000 graded merino sheep, with the necessary equipment of horses, vehicles, and general ranch paraphernalia. Ranch house built of brick with six rooms comfortably furnished according to the requirements of the climate, all within a strong barbed wire fence. The present ranch manager seems to be competent and reliable, and is rapidly placing upon a paying basis a business that, in other hands, had been allowed to suffer from neglect and misconduct. This property was secured by Colonel Bupre in a deal with the Western Irrigation Syndicate, and the title to it seems to be perfect. With careful management and the natural increase of land values, it ought to be made the foundation for a comfortable fortune for its owner. When Octavia ceased reading, Aunt Ellen uttered something as near a sniff as her breeding permitted. The prospectus, she went on, with uncompromising metropolitan suspicion, doesn't mention the centipedes or the Indians. And you never did like mutton, Octavia. I don't see what advantage you can derive from this desert. But Octavia was in a trance. Her eyes were steadily regarding something quite beyond their focus. Her lips were parted and her face was lighted by a kindling furor of the explorer, the ardent, striding disquiet of the adventurer. Suddenly she clasped her hands together exultantly. "'The problem solves itself, Auntie,' she cried. "'I'm going to that ranch. I'm going to live on it. I'm going to learn to like mutton, and even concede the good qualities of centipedes, at a respectful distance. It is just what I need. It's a new life that comes when my old one is just ending.' It's a release, Auntie. It isn't a narrowing. Think of the gallops over those leagues of prairies, with the wind tugging at the roots of your hair, the coming close to the earth, and learning over again the stories of the growing grass and the little wildflowers without names. Glorious is what it will be. Shall I be a shepherdess, with a Watu hat and a crook to keep the bad wolves from the lambs, or a typical western ranch girl with short hair like the pictures of her in the Sunday papers. I think the latter, and they'll have my picture, too, with the wildcats I've slain, single-handed, hanging from my saddle horn. From the four hundred to the flocks is the way they'll headline it, and they'll print photographs of the old Van Dresser mansion and the church where I was married. They won't have my picture, but they'll get an artist to draw it. I'll be wild and woolly, and I'll grow my own wool. Octavia, Aunt Ellen condensed, into the one word all the protests she was unable to utter. Don't say a word, Auntie, I'm going. I'll see the sky at night fit down on the world like a big butter dish cover, and I'll make friends again with the stars that I haven't had a chat with since I was a wee child. I wish to go. I'm tired of all this. I'm glad I haven't any money. I could bless Colonel Bupre for the ranch and forgive him for all his bubbles. What if the life will be rough and lonely? I deserve it. I'd shut my heart to everything except that miserable ambition. I, I wish to go away and forget, forget. Octavia swerved suddenly to her knees, laid her flushed face in her auntie's lap, and shook with turbulent sobs. Aunt Ellen bent over her and smoothed the coppery brown hair. I didn't know, she said gently. I didn't know that. Who was it, dear? When Mrs. Octavia Bupre, knee Van Dresser, stepped from the train at Nopal, her manner lost, for the moment, some of that easy certitude which had always marked her movements. The town was of recent establishment and seemed to have been hastily constructed of undressed lumber and flapping canvas. The element that had congregated about the station, though not offensively demonstrative, was clearly composed of citizens accustomed to and prepared for rude alarms. Octavia stood on the platform, against the telegraph office, and attempted to choose by intuition from the swaggering, straggling string of loungers, the manager, 
of the Rancho de las Sombras, who had been instructed by Mr. Bannister to meet her there. The tall, serious-looking elderly man in the blue flannel shirt and white tie she thought must be he. But no, he passed by, removing his gaze from the lady as hers rested on him, according to the southern custom. The manager, she thought, with some impatience at being kept waiting, should have no difficulty in selecting her. Young women, wearing the most recent thing in ash-colored traveling suits, were not so plentiful in Nopal. Thus keeping a speculative watch on all persons of possible managerial aspect, Octavia, with a catching breath and a start of surprise, suddenly became aware of Teddy Westlake hurrying along the platform in the direction of the train, of Teddy Westlake, or his sun-brown ghost, in cheviot, boots, and leather-girdled hat, Theodore Westlake, Jr., amateur polo, almost champion, all-around butterfly, and cumberer of the soil, but a broader, surer, more emphasized and determined Teddy than the one she had known a year ago when she last saw him. He perceived Octavia at almost the same time, deflected his course, and steered for her in his old, straightforward way. Something like awe came upon her, as the strangeness of his metamorphosis was brought into closer range. The rich red-brown of his complexion brought out so vividly his straw-colored mustache and steel-gray eyes. He seemed more grown up and somehow farther away. But when he spoke, the old boyish Teddy came back again. They had been friends from childhood. "'Why, Tav!' he exclaimed, unable to reduce his perplexity to coherence. "'How? What? When? Where?' "'Train,' said Octavia. "'Necessity. Ten minutes ago. Home. "'Your complexion's gone, Teddy. Now. How? What? When? Where?' "'I'm working down here,' said Teddy. He cast side glances about the station, as one does who tries to combine politeness with duty. "'You didn't notice on the train,' he asked, an old lady, with gray curls and a poodle, who occupied two seats with her bundles, and quarreled with the conductor, did you? I think not, answered Octavia, reflecting, and you haven't, by any chance, noticed a big gray mustached man in a blue shirt and six shooters with little flakes of merino wool sticking in his hair, have you? Lots of them, said Teddy, with symptoms of mental delirium under the strain. Do you happen to know any such individual? No, the description is imaginary. Is your interest in the old lady whom you describe a personal one? Never saw her in my life. She's painted entirely from fancy. She owns a little piece of property where I earn my bread and butter, the Rancho de las Sombras. I drove up to meet her according to arrangement with her lawyer. Octavia leaned against the wall of the telegraph office. Was this possible, and didn't he know? "'Are you the manager of that ranch?' she asked weakly. "'I am,' said Teddy with pride. "'I am Mrs. Beaupre,' said Octavia faintly. "'But my hair never would curl, and I was polite to the conductor.' For a moment that strange grown-up look came back and removed Teddy miles away from her. "'I hope you'll excuse me,' he said rather awkwardly. "'You see, I've been down here in the chaparral a year. "'I haven't heard. "'Give me your checks, please.' and I'll have your traps loaded into the wagon. Jose will follow with them. We'll travel ahead in the buckboard. Seated by Teddy in a featherweight buckboard, behind a pair of wild cream-colored Spanish ponies, Octavia abandoned all thought for the exhilaration of the present. They swept out of the little town and down the level road toward the south. Soon the road dwindled and disappeared, and they struck across a world carpeted with an endless reach of curly mesquite grass. The wheels made no sound. The tireless ponies bounded ahead at an unbroken gallop. The temperate wind, made fragrant by the thousands of acres of blue and yellow wildflowers, roared gloriously in their ears. The motion was aerial, ecstatic, with a thrilling sense of perpetuity in its effect. Octavia sat silent, possessed by a feeling of elemental, sensual bliss. Teddy seemed to be wrestling with some internal problem. "'I'm going to call you Madama,' he announced, as a result of his labors. "'That is what the Mexicans will call you. They're nearly all Mexicans on the ranch, you know. 
That seems to me about the proper thing. Very well, Mr. Westlake, said Octavia primly. Oh, now, said Teddy, in some consternation, that's carrying the thing too far, isn't it? Don't worry me with your beastly etiquette. I'm just beginning to live. Don't remind me of anything artificial. If only this air could be bottled. This much alone is worth coming for. Oh, look, there goes a deer. Jackrabbit, said Teddy, without turning his head. Could I, might I drive, suggested Octavia, panting with rose-tinted cheeks and the eye of an eager child. On one condition, could I, might I smoke? Forever, cried Octavia, taking the lines with solemn joy. How shall I know which way to drive? Keep her south by southeast, and all sail set. You see the black speck on the horizon, under that lowermost gulf cloud? That's a group of live oaks and a landmark. Steer halfway between that and the little hill to the left. I'll recite you the whole code of driving rules for the Texas prairies. Keep the reins from under the horse's feet and swear at them frequent. I'm too happy to swear, Ted. And, oh, why do people buy yachts or travel in palace cars when a buckboard and a pair of plugs and a spring morning like this can satisfy all desire? Now I'll ask you, protested Teddy, who was furtively striking match after match on the dashboard, not to call those denizens of the air plugs. They can kick out a hundred miles between daylight and dark. At last, he succeeded in snatching a light for his cigar from the flame held in the hollow of his hands. Room, said Octavia, intensely. That's what produces the effect. I know now what I've wanted. Scope, range, room. Smoking room, said Teddy, unsentimentally. I love to smoke in a buckboard. The wind blows the smoke into you and out again. It saves exertion. The two fell so naturally into their old-time good fellowship that it was only by degrees that a sense of the strangeness of the new relations between them came to be felt. Madama, said Teddy, wonderingly, however did you get it into your bead to cut the crowd and come down here? Is it a fad now among the upper classes to trot off the sheep ranches instead of off to Newport? I was broke, Teddy, said Octavia sweetly, with her interest centered upon steering safely between a Spanish dagger plant and a clump of chaparral. I haven't a thing in the world but this ranch, not even any other home to go to. Come now, said Teddy, anxiously but incredulously. You don't mean it. When my husband, said Octavia, with a shy slurring of the word, died three months ago, I thought I had a reasonable amount of the world's goods. His lawyer exploded that theory in a sixty-minute, fully illustrated lecture. I took to the sheep as a last resort. Do you happen to know of any fashionable caprice among the gilded youth of Manhattan that induces them to abandon polo and club windows to become managers of sheep ranches? It is easily explained in my case, responded Teddy promptly. I had to go to work. I couldn't have earned my board in New York. So I chummed a while with old Sanford, one of the syndicate that owned the ranch before Colonel Boupre bought it, and got a place down here. I wasn't manager at first. I jogged around on ponies and studied the business in detail until I got all the points in my head. I saw where it was losing and what the remedies were, and then Sanford put me in charge. I get a hundred dollars a month and I earn it. Poor Teddy, said Octavia with a smile. You needn't. I like it. I save half my wages, and I'm as hard as a water plug. It beats polo. Will it furnish bread and tea and jam for another outcast from civilization? The spring shearing, said the manager, just cleared up a deficit in last year's business. Wastefulness and inattention have been the rule heretofore. The autumn clip will leave a small profit over all expenses. Next year there will be a jam. When about four o'clock in the afternoon, the ponies rounded a gentle, brush-covered hill and then swooped like a double cream-colored cyclone upon the Rancho de las Sombras. Octavia gave a little cry of delight. A lordly grove of magnificent live oaks cast an area of grateful, cool shade whence the ranch had drawn its name, de las Sombras of the Shadows. The house of red brick, one story, ran low and long beneath the trees. 
Through its middle, dividing its six rooms in half, extended a broad, arched passageway, picturesque with flowering cactus and hanging red earthen jars. A gallery, low and broad, encircled the building. Vines climbed about it, and the adjacent ground was, for a space, covered with transplanted grass and shrubs. A little lake, long and narrow, glimmered in the sun at the rear. Further away stood the shacks of the Mexican workers, the corrals, wool sheds, and shearing pens. To the right lay the low hills, splattered with dark patches of chaparral. To the left, the unbounded green prairie, blending against the blue heavens. It's a home, Teddy, said Octavia breathlessly. That's what it is. It's a home. Not bad for a sheep ranch, admitted Teddy, with excusable pride. I've been tinkering on it at odd times. A Mexican youth sprang from somewhere in the grass and took charge of the creams. The mistress and the manager entered the house. Here's Mrs. McIntyre, said Teddy, as a placid, neat elderly lady came out upon the gallery to meet them. Mrs. Mack, here's the boss. Very likely she will be wanting a hunk of ham and a dish of beans after her drive. Mrs. McIntyre, the housekeeper, as much a fixture on the place as the lake or the live oaks, received the imputation of the ranch's resources of refreshment with mild indignation, and was about to give it utterance when Octavia spoke. Oh, Mrs. McIntyre, don't apologize for Teddy. Yes, I call him Teddy. So does everyone whom he hasn't duped into taking him seriously. You see, we used to cut paper dolls and play jack straws together ages ago. No one minds what he says. No, said Teddy, no one minds what he says, just so he doesn't do it again. Octavia cast one of those subtle, sidelong glances toward him from beneath her lowered eyelids, a glance that Teddy used to describe as an uppercut. But there was nothing in his ingenuous, weather tanned face to warrant a suspicion that he was making an illusion. Nothing. Beyond a doubt, thought Octavia, he had forgotten. Mr. Westlake likes his fun, said Mrs. McIntyre, as she conducted Octavia to her rooms. But, she added loyally, people around here usually pay attention to what he says when he talks in earnest. I don't know what would have become of this place without him. End of Part 1 of Madame Bo Peep of the Ranches.